it's a, a great pleasure to welcome Doris Lessing. Thank you so much for joining us. This is the finale of this um, interview marathon. And um, we've been thinking that it <coughs> could be interesting to talk to you about the city in uh, your work. And uh, I wanted to start with uh, um, London Observed and ask you about uh, the way how London matters in your, in your writing. Well, I've lived here since I was 30, you know, um, it's my hometown, so of course it matters to me immensely. When I arrived here, I had um, uh, no money and a small child, and um, London was very tough in those days. Not like now, it's a overflows of milk and honey. I mean, people of my age, looking at what London's like now, we can't believe it, the sheer fullness of everything. Everything is here. And what I came into was a place that had nothing. It was wall damage and was, everyone was poor. So of course, I mean, this is a long time we're talking about, so it would have to matter a lot to me. You wrote a marvelous short story called A Report on the Threatened City. And when I interviewed you some months ago, you emphasized very much this um, uh, kind of threat, but at the same time you said that we are rather good at dealing with the threat and at dealing with calamity. So I wanted to ask you to tell us a little bit about this report on the threatened city and the way to cope with threat. Well, um, I've just been reading James Lovelock and his cheerful theories about Gaia, um, that is the Earth who, uh, who, who is now supposed to be getting getting her own back for the way we treat her. And um, this, of course, is in a lot of what I write, because um, I think we're sort of dancing along the edge of a precipice, saying, look at me, look at me, look, aren't we clever? In actual fact, we're not clever at all. Well, James Lovelock um, is postulating all kinds of posture of of horrors produced, I mean, flooding, ice ages, you name it, the uh, Greenland current, you can go on for hours. But why, we don't really need Gaia to do us in because look what we do to her, Phil. I mean, this is something I could talk about since it's on my mind a lot, but I don't think this is probably the right time for it, though what we do to ourselves. At this very moment today, I'm reading about the forests in Brazil, which we are doing in. Um, now, we've known about this, what, 30 or 40 years? Does it stop us? It does not. In the same paper yesterday, it was about how we destroy the ocean by um, uh, our methods of fishing. We know we shouldn't do it, but we do do it. And so this is the thing that strikes me. We are an almost calamitously stupid species. That is what we are. And we don't take that into account with our planning or how we look at ourselves. We're always testing the boundaries of everything and hoping for the best. Well, we might not get the best. Um, I have a question about uh, what you call, or what is called visionary fiction or science fiction. Why does it have such an appeal for you? Is it, you know, science fiction is not um, a little shelf of books. It's an enormous um, uh, different kinds of books now. Uh, I mean, there, there's some books that uh, I mean, c could be called science fiction, and they're not. What are you going to do about Rushdie? It certainly isn't realism, is it? Or um, lots of books, um, they're certainly not realistic. I mean, you, when you say, do you like science fiction, it, we're talking about a universe of different kinds of writing. So I don't think it's easy to uh, 
talk about that so simply. No, no, but wh why do you yourself write it with, with intervals of sometimes 20 years? You know... What makes you... Why do I like writing it? Well, because if you're going to write about um, some kind of perspective, you can't start um, a book saying, um, Fred Blogg sat in his kitchen drinking some Thai food tea on the 1st of March in 1937. You can't do that. You have to spread it about a bit. You can't write about millions of years in a simple way. So uh, I've written a lot of books that are not realistic, um, but I started off with the Shikasta series simply because somebody said to me, um, nobody ever reads the great sacred books of the East, one after the other, like, um, um, uh, um, sorry, the, the Jewish one, the Jewish Bible, our Bible, the New Testament, the Koran, one after the other. If you do that, you will see that this is all the same story with the same characters, the same anecdotes, but nobody does that because um, as far as we're concerned, these religions are all uh, fenced off from each other. So I thought, it would be nice to write, it turned out to be Shikasta, about all the ideas that are in all these sacred books. And so you can't begin a book like that. As I say, Joe Bloggs preferred toast to muffins, you know, you can't do it like that. So that is why it turned into this great blockbuster of a book. To further continue with science fiction, um, in a recent conversation, you quoted science fiction writer Arthur Clarke, who talked about the way the lives of human beings will be changed in the next century. And uh, you, you made in relation to that some analogies with Gutenberg. And I wanted to ask you to maybe explain that uh, to us. With Gutenberg, the print revolution. Oh, yeah. No, what I was saying was that the invention of the um, computers and all these new things uh, is having as much an effect on our brains as the print revolution had in the Middle Ages. And we have no idea at all where it's all going to end. We do know that the children's brains are changed. I mean, the scientists now tell us that um, the children's brains are altered. Uh, we know that um, people can't keep very much in their minds for very long. We have a very short attention span. And uh, people can't read long books they say, no, I can't read long books. Well, what has happened is something has gone wrong with their brains, is not it? Because everybody else used to read books, long books without any difficulty. So what's happened? So this is what I meant, that we have a complete revolution in our minds, and we're not really taking it into account at all. We're not looking at it clearly. Ren was just pointing out that you, you have a text that we were wondering that it might be nice that you... You read it? <laughs> <laughs> if you'd asked me, I would have It would be one. marvelous. Yeah, yeah. This is because I have a very, very bad m uh, memory, and I have key words down, so that moment when I can't remember something, I can look and say, that's all this is. If you'd asked me, I'd have written a speech for you. <laughs> <laughs> now, we can make this as a conversation, because we have many, many uh, more questions. Um, you were suggesting, and I think it's a very good idea in relation also to um, uh, this uh, threat you mentioned that we were talking more about your recent uh, uh, books about uh, the story of General Dunn, and Mara's daughter, Grio, and the snow dog, and Mara and Dunn, which is a sequel. I wanted to ask you if you could tell us a little bit about these two books. Well, I wanted to write an adventure story. And I, there are rules for adventure stories. You can't uh, so I started off with Mara and Dan. One of uh, the basic rules are you have children who are badly treated, they're in prison with a bad stepmother, something or other, and they have to get out of the situation by their own cunning wits and courage. And they do, and they go on this long series of adventures with um, some people helping them and other people not helping them. You have to have a villain. I think I have a very good villain in Mara and Dan. And it has to end more or less happily, though I have to say Mara and Dan is a bit ambiguous, the ending. Then I wrote um, General Dan, because I got intrigued by this young man who we would say, 
uh, perhaps too easily, he was schizophrenic or something like that. He was um, good and bad are very tightly wound together in down. But I postulate, you see, that the Ice Age, the coming Ice Age, has um, swallowed up all of Europe. Why? Because I did not want to write an adventure story of the modern kind, sort of like um, James Bond, which is all about cars and machinery and all that kind of thing. That is an adventure story now. You cannot write about the modern world without writing like that. And that bores me. So I thought, okay, we will get rid of Europe and our civilization under the Ice Age. So we're in the future, and we're back with a kind of um, primitive savagery, which is much easier, believe me, than writing about cars and, and helicopters. And um, so then we're, it occurred to me afterwards that nobody in either of these books is not a refugee. Everybody is on the run from somewhere. A, a civil war, a flood, a drought, you name it. Everybody is running. And, but it didn't, I didn't realize that when I was actually writing it. So all these people are infinitely damaged surviving people. I'm not talking about General Dan. Uh, and the thing that links up with them, our friend here, look here, I'm doing this, I'm looking, James Lovelock, <laughs> Gaia, is that um, he postulates that quite soon, I don't know, a thousand years, 500 years, there'll be um, only warlords left with a few breeding women, because after all, you have to have breeding women if you want the human race to go on. And the, a warlord thinks one day, you know, there are all these myths about us. We are all legend, amazing people. And one war, warlord was watching a bird fly and thinking, that lot, that lot back there, these clever people, they flew, they flew in machines. How did they do that, thinks this savage. How is he going to find out what we were like? How? Is there, under the flood or under the ice or something, there's a room within it, the instructions of how to make our civilization? in MIT or Cambridge, England or somewhere. No, there is no place. Because I was so dispersed and spread about, and the knowledge of how to make it is in a lot of different minds. It isn't in just one, not even on the computer, which is so extremely unreliable. So um, this warlord, you see, what he would like is to have a place where all that dead civilization is, so I've invented it, um, in the center where all our artifacts are, but not the knowledge of how to do them. It's actually very, very uh, interesting because it's the second time today we talk about Gaia and also Lovelock and Mary Mitchley was here earlier today and had mm -hmm. also evoked uh, this issue. One other recent book I wanted to ask you about is the Grand Models, which is um, a very different story. It is actually um, a kind of a portrait of a very extended family. Could you tell us about the grandmothers? Well, the, the three realistic stories in, in that, uh, there are four um, stories, uh, short novels or, short, or long stories. Uh, they're all true, and I put them together because they were true. Um, the grandmothers is a story that was told to me. Um, the basic story is that there were two um, women whose husbands uh, went off with, anyway, they were by themselves uh, with two boys. And they had love affairs across, you know, one woman had an affair with her friend's son, etc. This went on for 10 years. Um, and then the women ended it. And the young man who told me about it, and this is really interesting, he was a friend of the two boys. And he was extremely angry with the women for ending it. He kept saying, that's what women are like, you see. They don't care, they don't care about our feelings. All they care, they're just practical and stupid. So this, this is what I was listening to. I was listening to this shocking story, which it is. You can make it one. Or, um, I've lost my thread, hang on, yes. He was angry because the women were callous and brutal and ended it. And he said, and I kept saying to him, look, I said, Knowing what life is like, you do know that in, let's say, 10 years after the time you were watching this, 
the women would be old and it would come to an end in any case. You do realize that. She said, no, no, I don't want to think about that. I don't want to know about this. This is how women talk, you see. This is what you talk. This is how you talk. This is why you're so cold and heartless. This is why this, this man is a bit drunk and sending himself up. And it was very funny. I had to write that story. I cannot think of any writer I've ever met who would not want to write that story. So I did. And the other the story about the love child is true. Um, and the story about the, the black girl who lost her daughter to the middle classes and you happen to be American, that story. But when I, this was interesting, when I changed the story from New York to London, um, it was no longer a, a story about race, it was about class, because they're in good in, in, in England, you know, class. Race is, it wasn't important. Race was not the important thing in that story. It was the fact that um, this little girl was going to go up into the middle classes and become a middle class person. But you see, I think it would be different in America. I have never lived there, but so we think. Hmm. We have questions. No, it's, it's unbelievably uh, exciting to uh, hear you carried away by your stories, your own stories, and, and so much more inspiring than many of the kind of political harangues we've heard this afternoon. I have a few more <laughs> questions. One thing I wanted to ask you is, Eric Hobsbawm gave us the advice uh, to protest against forgetting in this marathon and to kind of think about memory. And I was wondering if you could tell us about the sort of whole notion of uh, memory in relation to uh, uh, the current moment? I wrote uh, uh, in my, uh, my two autobiographies a lot about memory. It's, uh, you know, a lot of it. I spent a lot of time thinking about it. So I see they've got this series running on memory. But so far they haven't said anything that I hadn't said in my autobiography a long time ago. So I'm waiting for them to say something that I hadn't thought of myself. Sorry, I'm, I've got... Um, do you have any unrealized projects, unwritten book, or...? <laughs> you know, I'm getting too old to have many unwritten projects. I do have one or two, and um, I keep thinking, am I ever going to write that? So, yes, I do, of course, because I don't have any problem about ideas. My problem is that I never have enough time for everything, and even less now, as you can see. So I can't now say, oh, well, I'm going to write this, I'm going to write that, I'm going to write that, because I won't, you know. So uh, it's a, it brings you up a bit short, doesn't it? <laughs> I have a very last question. I reread some time ago the uh, very nice small book uh, Rainer Maria Rilke wrote, which is a kind of an advice to a young poet. And I was wondering what would be your advice in 2006 to a young writer? To a writer or poet? Either well, way. Well, they're different animals. <laughs> 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 Very different. Well, poet, poets are... Uh, uh, novelists are much more down-to-earth and solid and earth-based than poets. And poets tend to be at their best, most of them fairly young. Whereas I think that we do better from middle age onwards. We're completely different. Do you remember this, um, oh, this Russian chap? Oh, God, here I go. He said, I cannot remember a damn thing. Mandelstam. He said uh, when a poem was coming, he seemed to hear a kind of a buzz. He would talk to uh, his wife, Nadezhda. He said, I've got my buzz. I can hear it. And then they would turn into words. I don't think novelists are like that. We're, we get excited with people and ideas and all that has to get down. But a poet is a different... I mean, I've known quite a few poets. They are, are not... Um, they're not as, as earth-based as we are. They're not. Mm. Many, many thanks. Mm. Many thanks. Thank you.